Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. Meet the sheriffs. Let's go and introduce ourselves. Got an icon route to attend here today. If it's not pie, we're going to be removing the stuff. Their job is to get you your money back. It's about to get physical. It's the rest of all offence to stop me and do my job. If you've been ripped off and don't know where to turn... We need to deal with it now. We're going to remove vehicles to that value. If you're acting on his authority, pay it. If you've been to court but still not been paid what you're owed... Are you going to open this building, sir, or am I going to force entry into it? You need to pay this. It's time to call the sheriff. That's the drag's on me. I'm going to call the locksmith. Effect entry into the premises and remove all the items. Whoa, 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 whoa. They're enforcement agents of the High Court, and the law says they're on your side. It's collected 42 grand. Coming up... Lucy Horton won an injury claim when a tattoo removal left her scarred for life. A minor procedure like laser tattoo removal shouldn't cause third-degree burns. Sheriff Pete Spencer confronts the salon owner, but will he get Lucy her money? When repairs to Mohammed Razak's dream car went wrong, it cost him a fortune. It's cost me £8,000 to £9,000 and left me without a vehicle for 67 months. Sheriffs Lawrence and Kev pay the garage a visit. Can they get him the money he's owed? If you're acting on his authority to pay it, pay it. In Cumbria, Sheriffs Chris and Steve have to be at their sharpest when they go on the trail of a roofing company. Can they get them to pay up? Of a high court writ. You're not going to pay it. But first, Sheriff Pete Spencer is on the lookout for a business in West Yorkshire. See what we find when we get there. Hopefully, somebody will be there and uh, we'll pay in full. This is a case of tattoo removal that went badly wrong. The person Pete's on his way to help is Lucy Horton from Todmorden in West Yorkshire. She's a professional beauty therapist dedicated to making other people look as good as she possibly can. I do nails, massage, eye treatments, waxing, that kind of thing. And when I started at the college, I just loved it. And it's been my passion ever since. But Lucy herself was given a cosmetic procedure so bad, it left her physically and emotionally scarred for life. Forced to go to court, and to the doors of the sheriffs for help. Lucy's problem started after she got offered her dream job, working as a beauty therapist on a cruise ship. Um, I was trying to mix a little bit of work with pleasure, and be able to meet new people, have fun. But the job came with a strict condition. Lucy had a butterfly tattoo underneath her left wrist. If she wanted the job, she would have to get it removed. When I found out I had to get rid of my tattoo, I was obviously devastated, but turning down the job on the ships was never a consideration for me. She'd heard about a laser procedure offered by a local beauty parlour, Heron Beauty World, near Halifax. My mum had been there before. She'd started having a tattoo removed. I'd been there for my hair done before. It was a salon that had been recommended by other people. The man that carried out the treatment for me made me feel really confident that it was going to work. He showed me evidence of other people that he'd treated. He was a professional. He was the one that I was taking the advice from, so I believed everything that he told me. It wasn't cheap, but it was what she wanted, so Lucy paid them £800 for as many sessions as it took to complete the job. The first few treatments were unpleasant, but fitted in with what she'd been told to expect. But when Lucy went back for her fifth session, something had changed. He informed me that he'd got a new machine. It'd be quicker um, and less painful, which obviously for me was a, a bonus. It's a painful process to go through anyway, and to have it a little bit easier was obviously something I was thrilled about, so I was happy to go forward with the treatment. During the treatment, I found that it was more painful, with a lot more heat and a lot more depth to it. Um, it had me in tears. I couldn't breathe properly. 
with the machine, it kept cutting out. I had a friend with me and she asked me if I was okay because I was crying that much. And I just said to her, don't talk to me, I'll be sick. And then at that point, the man asked me if I was okay, um, which I replied that it was a lot more painful than usual. And he just told me that we were nearly finished. He rubbed some aloe vera gel on it at the end and told me that everything would be fine. But a few days after the procedure, Lucy's wrist became inflamed. It wasn't until about a week later that I realised things weren't going as they normally would. When you touched it after the blisters had popped, it was like jelly under the skin. I went to the doctors and it was there that they told me I had an infection and I was put on antibiotics. Then after that, it still didn't heal. The skin came off and you could see all the jelly underneath. Lucy took herself to accident and emergency. The doctors told her she had third degree burns and a serious infection. When I found out that I had um, third degree burns, I was obviously a little bit mortified. It's not something you expect from a procedure like that, um, from having a tattoo lasered. Ugh, sorry, I'm a bit emotional about it. But Lucy still didn't realise how serious the situation was. I was a little bit naive and carried on thinking that it'd heal normally and I'd carry on with the procedure and still get to go on with cruise ships. The wound took weeks to heal and Lucy's dream of working on the cruise ships faded. Far from disappearing, the burn formed a disfiguring scar. Lucy was still in considerable pain and for a while lost some use of her hand. I struggled to have a bath on my own, do my hair on my own, just because of the pain and not being able to make a fist or use my hand properly. Lucy's mum, Hazel, was shocked at how the treatment affected her daughter. Lucy changed from being a, a bright and vivacious fe young female with, with a life ahead of her. She turned more or less overnight into somebody that was very withdrawn. She didn't want to go out. She didn't really want to communicate with anybody. And she was quite an angry young lady. The hospital told Lucy she would need a skin graft. They took um, skin from my thigh and put it onto my wrist. Um, as you can see, it's still quite a severe scar and it's something that's not going to heal any more than that. Appalled at what had happened to her and determined to get justice, Lucy took the salon boss to court. He contested the case. So when we were attended court for the final hearing, it had been a very emotional and difficult time for me. And I struggled with it, I really did. Sorry. The case was heard in the small claims court, where Lucy got the maximum personal injury award of £1,000, a refund of the treatment fee and costs. When the judge awarded the case in our favour, I brought down, I couldn't believe it. It was such a relief for it to all finally be over and to know that I'd got what I deserved and that I wasn't fighting a lost cause. The judge praised my mum and I for what we'd done. In total, the salon owner was ordered to pay Lucy £2,430. He agreed to pay in £500 instalments, but the payment stopped. Despite all the pain caused, Lucy still hasn't been paid what she's owed. Now, over four years after the treatment, it's time for Pete to make sure the salon boss pays what's due. Pete doesn't know the details of Lucy's story, but he knows he has to get her the money. Oh yeah, okay. What's he about? The staff seem surprised to see Pete, who is fairly obviously not a customer. He's looking for the owner who performed the disastrous tattoo removal. Oh yeah, good afternoon. Got an high court rate to attend here today. Do you want to speak through it? High court rate. And there he is. Do you want to speak through it? See you in front of your customers? Well, you're not talking to me. The salon boss doesn't want to appear on television, and our camera is asked to go outside while Pete outlines the case. The owner says he has no money. Pete says in that case, he'll have to remove goods to auction to pay off the debt. The salon owner suggests removing just one item that's worth the amount owed. Pete's shown a laser the owner claims cost £25,000 and will be worth at least £2,500. Talking about £25,000 uh, tattoo removal, 
um, machine, um, which I mean looks maybe in between three to five hundred pound at auction value to me. With the costs involved in Pete taking goods, it would be cheaper to pay the full amount. I've given him 10 15 minutes to try and make some phone calls to, to raise the funds rather than us remove goods. Faced with having several items removed and sold, the debtor has a change of heart and finds someone to pay the money for him. Pete comes out again to fill us in. He's got his uh, daughter on route. Um, with a, a credit card, that's going to pay the balance in full. Um, she's about five, ten minutes away, so uh, hopefully once she arrives, we'll, uh, credit card will work and we'll, we'll have a full payment. Sound cheers. Moments later, the card arrives. Would you like to bring your machine in? Do you want to do it our way and then you're not disturbing your customers? No, it's all right. Okay. No. All right. <laughs> Although Pete offers the option of doing the payment discreetly, the salon boss doesn't seem to mind people knowing the sheriffs have called. Try and be as discreet as what we can, really. I don't like yeah, disturbing yeah, customers and stuff. At the end of the day, it's your business, isn't it? So. Yeah, it doesn't matter. I'll, uh, I'll put a banner outside afterwards. <laughs> when Lucy Horton came here in 2009, she left scarred for life. Finally, the salon has paid her the money she is due. All cleared up, paid in full. Money will be gone to the claimant now. This money that I'm going to be receiving, it just... It means that I'll have closure on everything that's happened in the last four years. It means that I can move on with my life and aim for that dream job that I've wanted to do for the past four years and that I can finally go ahead and do that. It's going to help finance my time in London during the training period before I actually get on the cruise ship. These days, sheriffs are officially called enforcement agents of the High Court. I've been sent today to the High Court to clear the debt. No, 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 we're higher than a bailiff. If you've been awarded money by a court but haven't been paid, the sheriffs can enforce a writ and get you what you're owed. I'm here with a court order to collect the sum of £34,311. £6,246.99. We've come to collect £12,056.76. And if the debtor won't pay, they have the power to remove goods and have them sold at auction to pay off the debt. I'm going to call the locksmith then, sir. Effect entry into the premises and remove all the items. Freddy's coming with us for today. High Court enforcement agents, commonly known as sheriffs, have to enforce writs all over the country. Today was an especially early start for Lawrence Grix and Kev McNally, who have already put some miles under their belt before breakfast. Just coming into Bristol at the moment. It's half past eight in the morning. We're going to a business called Clayton Cars, or a, a BMW specialist garage. The person they're on their way to help is Mohammed Razak from Bristol. He owns and runs an off-license in the city. Cheers, then. Thank you. Recently, he decided to invest in a new car for pleasure and for work, buying a BMW 3 Series. My car was really important to me because I've got two businesses. You, you need to get around if you've got two businesses. Obviously, I need to carry stock, carry my staff members. It's part of life, having your own car. Mohammed bought the car for £16,000 and looked forward to driving it. But only a few days after purchasing it, the car encountered some minor problems. Needing to get it fixed, Mohammed looked online and soon thought he'd found the perfect place. It was called Clayton Cars, BMW Specialists. So I thought, why not take it to them? They looked really professional. Clayton Cars looked at the car and told him there were major problems with the engine. They said they could fix it and Mohammed said he'd cover any costs and left it with them. After about three weeks, I called up the garage and I said, I haven't heard anything, what's the latest? So they said there seems to be a problem that they cannot seem to work out what's wrong with the vehicle. I then was kind of losing faith in the garage, but I thought, they know what they're doing, they're BMW specialists, and quite a few people actually recommended me to them. And then after about six or seven weeks, I got very impatient because at this time I'm without my vehicle. I got to catch lifts. I got asked my missus for a lift. I got asked my parents for lifts. So I did really need my car. 
Mohammed says that over six weeks after they got the car, Clayton Cars told him they diagnosed problems with the catalytic converter and exhaust manifold. They said it would cost £3,169 to fix. Mohammed was happy to bear the cost for his beloved BMW. A few weeks later with the work done, Mohammed paid up the £3,169 and drove his car home. Really happy. It drove absolutely perfect for the first few hours. After three hours of not making no issues, it then had the engine management light flashing. The car was shaking again, the gearbox was shaking, the exhaust manifold was making a noise, um, and the car revs wasn't still, and it was revving up and down. Instantly, I knew that something's not right. Mohammed decided to take his car to another BMW specialist. They now diagnosed a fault with the NOx sensor, which detects potentially damaging gases in the exhaust of the car. Mohammed says they told him it should have been replaced before any of the other repairs, because a faulty NOx sensor could harm key engine parts. It would cost another £3,500. Mohammed agreed. He says he asked Clayton Cars for a refund so he could pay this second bill, but they wouldn't pay. But until he paid their bill, the second garage held onto his car. So the vehicle should have been repaired in one week. It's cost me £8,000 to £9,000 and left me without a vehicle for six to seven months. He was left with no option but to take Clayton Cars to court. It made me feel like they're taking me for a joke because I'm just a young boy and they think that they could just fob me off. I thought, right, I'm going to go to court and get my money off them. Clayton Cars didn't contest it. In their absence, the judgment went against them. Despite this, they still haven't paid the money awarded by the court. I've won my judgment. I still haven't received the money. If the sheriffs can't get the money, then no one will. It's now time for Lawrence and Kev to finally put an end to Mohammed's misery. What's the name of him? Clayton Cars. That's it. First challenge, find the boss. Mr Grix, I've yeah. got a High Court writ to execute against Clayton Cars okay. on behalf of Mr Mohammed Razak. OK, yeah. Are you in a position to pay in full I've or do you need to contact the governor? I can or... try and contact him, yeah. Yeah, if you can, do yeah. yeah. Kev has a look round the workshop. As expected, there are plenty of assets that could be removed and auctioned, if necessary, to pay off the debt. The diagnostics as well. Do you want to show that to us? Um, got that thing over there. That's yours, yeah? That's yours. Okay. Kev lists the diagnostic equipment. This kit is valuable, portable and vital. Its removal could cause real problems for the garage. Lawrence and Kev want the garage to find the boss and pay up as quickly as possible. Taking an inventory and preparing to remove the gear usually has the desired effect. We've got this four post lift over there. There's another four two post lifts as well. So there's assets here if we need to remove. Lawrence doesn't like hanging about, but if he's forced to, it might as well be in a well-equipped workshop. He'd love a workshop like this. Four post lift, that's his dream. That's his lottery win, that is. Yes, indeed. But it's time to stop dreaming. The boss has arrived. Morning. How are you Morning. Doing? Well, I'll just show you my ID. The amount outstanding is 5,483.46 because it's been transferred up to the High Court for enforcement Sheriff's purposes. Speaker, You've got, right yeah. What's, who's the sheriff? Are you the sheriff? Well, our company, yeah. So that, that's the amount that's outstanding, just under five and a half grand. I got the 483. The owner has already spoken to his solicitors, who have assured him they're dealing with the case. It's a little bit premature because they've sort of done what they can do and they're waiting to hear back from the courts. I mean, problem being, we're here with a live writ which orders us to clear the debt. This is what the solicitors just sent you. Uh, he sent this across. Well, can you just scroll it down so I can... Uh... The paperwork is an application to set aside the case, but no decision's been made. Yeah. Unfortunately, an application doesn't prevent enforcement in these paying now or, or we're going to carry on enforcing the writ. And we've taken an inventory of goods. Why well, can't you just wait for We this can't, to... because, we're, because we have a live writ which orders yeah, us. It's, it's, a, that's it's, it's, not a case, it's not a case of waiting. There was an order made 
for you to pay, you didn't, and you've got plenty of goods here to clear the debt. What, what bits do you want to take out of this place you were going to take some bits then? The main thing that leaps out to me is the, um, is the diagnostic kit over there. I'm quite happy to wait for your solicitor to phone you back, providing they're not hours, because we've been here hour and 40 minutes already. Lawrence is frustrated that the owner won't deal with the writ until his solicitor calls back. If you could get on it as quick as you can, I do appreciate that. I think he considers us taking his stuff as an option, whereas realistically, for him, that would be a very expensive option. Again, the owner tries to get hold of his solicitor, and again he's told that they will call him back. Mohammed waited weeks for Clayton Cars to fix his BMW. The sheriffs have waited hours for the garage to respond to their writ. Frustration is growing. When we return, we'll see if Clayton Cars pays up. Advice is coming from everywhere. Nobody is telling you how it is other than me. In the rural northwest of England, there's the prospect of a day enforcing writs in the countryside for sheriffs Chris Pearson and Steve Hockborn. We're in Cumbria this morning. We're looking for a company, Cumbria Roofing Northwest Limited. Uh, we're looking for £2,913.69 on behalf of a Mrs. Kathleen Ann Horton. It's a relatively small amount, so there should be enough assets in the way of vehicles to cover the debt. Mrs. Horton paid Cumbria Roofing Northwest Limited, not to be confused with any other company of a similar name, £3,000 to apply a special liquid plastic waterproof coating to the stairs and balcony of her property. But she wasn't happy with the quality of their work. The company eventually agreed to refund £1,800, but Kathleen never received the money. She took the company to court, where they contested the case. Mrs. Horton won but the company didn't pay up. Now she's taken her claim to the High Court, and Chris and Steve are on their way to enforce the writ and get her money. It's a bit grey, but Chris wouldn't be anywhere else. One of the most beautiful places in the UK, as far as I'm concerned. The weather's not the best. The summer is very similar to the winter. Chris and Steve soon find Cumbria Roofing Northwest Limited on an industrial estate. Looks like there's somebody in. There's another entrance. I'll have a look. Anything? Hello? There's something on in there. There's a phone number. Yeah. Give him a ring and see if we can get somebody here, basically, uh, to deal with uh, the situation. Could you give me a ring back urgently, please? The sheriffs have the right to enter commercial premises and, if necessary, remove property to auction to pay off the debt. If need be, they'll call a locksmith and force entry. But Steve is hoping to get someone to open up. There's no vans. Hello, sir. Is it possible for you to get back to the unit for us, please? It's Mr. Pearson with a high court writ. You're not going to pay it? All right, is anybody who can come and deal with it for you? No, we don't. We, we can't come back tomorrow, sir. Now, we do at this stage have power of locksmith if needs be. I'd much rather deal with one of your employees or yourself. I can wait for you. Thanks a lot, tell her. Hopefully, that'll get him here. But all we can do now is have a coffee and wait for him to turn up. Just two minutes later, someone does turn up, but it's not the boss. Hi, are you from this young here, love? Yeah. Have you just come to work, have you? Yeah. Right, OK, right. We'll let you go and you'll see what you need to do. OK, thank you very much. As soon as she goes in, we can follow her in. But there's something Chris and Steve have failed to spot. Do you have a contact number for me, love? I have not. No. They're the keys for the unit. No way. She's been told to come and get them. How many female roofers do you know? Yeah. How did we not see them? The seasoned sheriffs failed to spot that the keys to the unit were on the windowsill, and the woman was able to take them from under their noses. Hey, it's Mr. Pearson. I've just spoken to you. Uh, the lady who I, I believe you've probably just spoken to to attend and remove the keys has done that. 
Uh, now, that's saying to me that you don't want to deal with this. Now, how long are you want to be? And you said an hour and a half, but why have you asked the lady to come and take the keys away? 30 minutes. Right, no problem. I'll see you when you get back then, thank you. Tell her now. 30 minutes. Give him 30 minutes, see if he turns up. I can't believe we didn't spot them keys. That shows me that he's not interested in paying today. The man calls back. He asks our camera to leave his property. He says he will meet Chris, but not in front of the cameras, and will call again with details of the meeting place. Hello, can I help? The man has arrived, but not wanting to be filmed, has concealed himself away from the company's unit. Bridge? Oh, yeah, yeah. No problem, mate. Okay. Alone, Chris makes his way to the clandestine meeting place. Steve waits for a few minutes. Now he's going to help apply some pressure and hopefully get this case resolved. He's had enough time now. I think Chris should have been able to establish whether he's going to pay or not, so I will walk down and join him. We'll leave the van here. But as Steve makes to join the other two under the bridge, he's stopped in his tracks. Hello? Yeah, bring it round, yeah? He wants the card machines. Fees he's going to pay in full. Payment in full. It's a result for the sheriffs. Steve takes the machine to the man's van on the other side of the bridge, but is quickly back. The fella's not happy. But then again, he would be. He's just about to pay three grand out. That he should have paid out months ago. And finally, the writ is settled in full. But Steve can't help reflecting on the keys he reckons Chris failed to spot. I would have thought he just would have found them straight away, so I didn't go and look for them. The key issue was very funny. He needs to be back in the classroom for a couple of days just to make sure he's up to scratch. He's paid his debt off. Uh, there was no great concern about that, no grievance about doing that. A little concern about the cost, but such is life. A good result for Kathleen Horton, who will finally get the money she's due for the poor work done by Cumbria Roofing Northwest Limited. For Chris and Steve, it's been a straightforward job. Apart from the secret meetings under the bridge, and of course those keys. Yeah, I'm just going to blame that on Steve, wholly and fully. That's the end of the matter. Okay, I don't want to hear fun. anything else about it. <laughs> In Bristol, Lawrence and Kev are trying to get BMW owner Mohamed Razak over £3,000 from Clayton Cars, who he says didn't repair his car properly. It made me feel like they're taking me for a joke because I'm just a young boy and they think that they could just fob me off. The garage owner won't deal with the writ until he's spoken to his solicitor. But all his solicitors can tell him is that someone will call him back. The boss instead consults his bookkeeper. And the sheriff turned up today to get some money off the boat. The bookkeeper suggests he contact the solicitor. Yeah, I've tried to get all the solicitors and they're taking time to come back to me. Um, he's got he's got a uh, high court writ in front of him. So I can just I can just do that, you reckon? Yeah, apparently we, we, we shouldn't be, uh, it's all under the, in the hands of solicitors. And they're gonna, we sort it out. <laughs> well, they may well do, but they haven't sorted it out today, have they? If you don't pay us, then we've got an awful lot of stuff to take out of here to clear the debt. Nothing personal, but you've got the assets there to, to enable us to clear this debt, I believe. Once again, the owner tries to speak to his solicitors and convey how urgent the situation is. The solicitors say someone will call back. Thank you very much. As quick as you can, that'd be much appreciated. Thank you. Bye. They're all getting hungry. They're not going to lunch, are they? No, they probably are. <laughs> Finally, some three hours after the sheriff's arrived at the garage, the owner gets through to his solicitor. Do you mind having a chat with them? Yeah, sure, not a problem. Yeah, I'll pass you over. And the battery life left, I think. Man. Hello there. We're aware that there's been a, an application to set aside. We have a live writ. 
it's a simple question, yes or no, and I know the answer. Does an application prevent enforcement of a writ? No, right, can, you can I just hand you over and so you can tell him that then? Thank you. Hello. Have you not done something you should have done for me? The owner doesn't seem to like what he's hearing from the solicitor. I'm going to have to be on your case, aren't I? Because I've just left it to the, the experts or the solicitors and I've, and I've suddenly got um, the guy knocking on the door. The owner calls his bookkeeper and seems to be talking about payment. She can do the, um, you know, if we, do it, if we do it that way. That's the account name, account number and the sort code. I don't think that's the right way. I don't think it's easy as ringing the police up. They probably... The police won't do anything. No, the police won't do anything. It's a hell of a lot of money and I don't want to hand it over. Come on, you've got to do it, don't Hey. You're still having a conversation about how you can get out of paying it. It's the full amount now. I've had enough. Lawrence calls up a truck so they can start removing goods. Yeah, if you can, do urgently, please. It's full amount. You can deal with Mohammed in court. End of. The guy's been going around in circles, really, literally asking anyone in the world for advice or how not to pay, basically. He's asked his solicitor, he's asked someone else's solicitor, and then he's anyone else that wants to put their 10 pence worth in has been doing so, and it hasn't really got him anywhere. Advice is coming from everywhere. Nobody is telling you how it is other than me. There's no arguments to be had anymore. This is the bottom line, this is the way it is. A few minutes later, Lawrence's message seems to have got through. The bookkeeper arrives at the garage. So this, so this is the sheriff? She tells Lawrence that the case is in dispute and going to court. No disrespect to yourself, I know you've just sort of come into this, but I'm not going into another lengthy discussion about the whys and wherefores of us being here. We're entitled to be here. That is how much needs paying, or we will be removing stuff. I've already queued the office up to line up a truck to come down and take it with some men to lift the stuff out. She tells Lawrence he can't take the tools of the trade. Yeah. They're not tools of the trade. The only things that are tools of the trade are the guy's personal hand tool. Are you acting on the gentleman's authority to come down and pay this? Because we've been going on for four hours, 45 minutes. We're not going to stay around while you have the discussion of whether he's spoken to his solicitors. That's something for you to deal with afterwards. If you're acting on his authority got, to pay got, it, pay it. And finally, that's exactly what the bookkeeper does. There's your receipt. OK, then. We'll leave you in peace. And obviously, whatever the courts say, we'll comply with. Yeah. OK. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That was not the job from hell, but it was a war of attrition. Nearly five hours there. But we got payment in full in the end. Since we filmed, Clayton Cars pushed on with their application to have the judgment set aside. And this time, both the garage and their solicitor were present in court. Mohammed Razak had to face them alone. The judge rejected the garage's request for the judgment to be set aside, which means Mohammed keeps the money the sheriff's recovered from Clayton Cars. And he has a message for any individuals wondering if they could take on a business and win. Do go to the courts because there is justice out there and look up how to fight a case in court. Another success for a member of the public who fought for his rights. Clayton Cars told us they fixed the problem of the car not starting by replacing parts. They also recommended a further part replacement, but Mohammed did not have this done. They believe had he done so, this would have stopped further problems. Clayton Cars also said their solicitor had apologised to them for mistakes made which led to the application to set aside the judgement being dismissed, and had made a payment to them in respect of this failure. Enforcement agents Daryl Oriton and Mark Povey are in East Anglia, about to bring some unwelcome news to a firm in the demolition business. Just coming into um, a Suffolk now, a company called KT Demolition Limited. They've been sued in the high courts by another company, and we're there for just under £9,000. The company took KT Demolition to court for work it carried out for them, but for which it wasn't fully paid. KT Demolition contested the claim, but the court awarded in the other company's favour. But they've still not received the money they're owed. So now it's up to Daryl and Mark to get it for them.
Arriving at KT Demolition's trading premises, it's clear they're not dealing with a multinational. Afternoon. We've got a high court writ. It's not against you. It's against your company, KT Demolition Limited. Right. We've come out today to collect the the amount, which is just under nine thousand pounds. Are you aware of this? Of, no, I'm not. You're not aware of the debt at all. I am because I went to court over this. Right. Right, and and the court, the court then turned round and sort of like molested straight out of court. And Wrong. that is it. But that's not what the court documents say. See, we've got the original judgment right. um, where the debt was. You've been ordered that the judgment for the claimant is 6869 and 10 p and also to pay £250 costs, payable within 14 days. Right. Because you haven't done that. I don't know anything about it. Right. I mean, did you attend the court hearing? Yeah. On the I did. 20, 28th of May? Yeah, I went. Norwich. Yeah. Right. I offered to pay the man so much. Yeah. I didn't I didn't refuse the debt and nothing. All right. right. So I said, yeah. I'd pay, but okay. he wouldn't accept it. He wouldn't accept it. He wouldn't accept installments. He wouldn't, no. He right, wouldn't. you only one guy. No, he did, yeah. and I didn't have it. Right. So what do you do when you haven't got it? Whatever the business owner's excuses, Daryl needs the debt paying today. So what are you got to do now? We would possibly remove assets. Come in, take what you can. Is this where you, you are trading yeah. from, is it, yeah? What about the vehicle? Is that, in, is that your name or company name? Company. That's in the company name. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to try? Do you want to I try? Mean, that's, that's, a, that's more than nine grand, that is. That is, yeah. 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 Would you be not better off trying to get the money raised as opposed for us taking removing that today? Daryl's being as helpful as he can. If he has to, he'll take the Range Rover to pay off the debt but it would be easier for him, not to mention cheaper for the director, if he could raise the cash another way. We'd rather give you a bit of time now to, I know you say you don't know anybody with that money, but get on the phone, make some phone calls, see what you can raise, rather than us phoning a truck to come and collect your vehicle straight away. At this stage, Daryl and Mark are invited in to speak to the director in private. We're asked to stay outside. <laughs> Soon after, the director's wife arrives to help him out. He's adamant they went to court and the judge threw out the case against the company. But Daryl's high court writ tells a very different story. Faced with a high court writ, two sheriffs in his house and a very vulnerable looking Range Rover on his drive, it doesn't take the director long to realize this debt isn't going away. After discussions with his wife, they agree to pay on a credit card. Should we join on credit or debit? Give me the option. <laughs> the money goes through without a problem. It's a result for Daryl and Mark, and means the company that brought the case will finally get the money that's rightfully theirs. Lawrence and Kev are in the van again and heading into Kent on the trail of an antiques dealer. It is an individual, but initially we're being sent to his, uh, his business address. The total debt outstanding is £3,253.18 and our claimant is Sussex Turnery and Moulding Company Limited. The debt is for several orders of timber from Sussex Turnery and Moulding Company Limited, which the antiques dealer didn't pay for. When he stopped replying to communications, the company took him to court. The case wasn't contested and he was ordered to pay. The company operating in Sussex since 1957 still hasn't received the money and has called in Lawrence and Kev. Looks like we're getting closer. A visit to an antiques dealer with a debt is a promising job for both our sheriffs. Hopefully, they'll have some antiques of some value that we can need be removed to clear the debt. But that's, uh, that's when I hand over to Kev, my antiques guru. Oh, my dad's had an antiques furniture business for the last 35 years. 
Um, I worked there for a bit, sort of grown up in and around the shop. I know a fair bit about furniture, I guess. The left end of this car park. Finding the premises where the antiques dealer operates from, Lawrence and Kev head inside. Hello there. To look for the man on their writ. He's not here. He's out on the van. Right. Do you want me to phone him for you? Yes, please, yeah. As the other trader calls their debtor, it's clear there are plenty of potentially valuable antiques around. But the place is used by several dealers, so the challenge will be pinning down exactly what belongs to the man on Lawrence's writ. Then the dealer thereafter comes on the phone. Hello, sir. My name's Mr Griggs. I'm here to execute a High Court writ in favour of Sussex Turn Turnery and Moulding Company Limited to the value of £3,253.18. The only way to prevent further action today is to pay it in full, sir. But the debtor says he's never heard of the claimant, Sussex Turnery and Moulding Company. That's obviously their official name. I may have a trading name that I don't know of. The dealer does agree to meet the sheriffs. OK, sir, that's fine. Yep, yep, if you make your way back here, we'll speak to you when you get here. While they wait, Kev sizes up the situation. It's 120 quid. Ed Walden, is it? Solid wood. It's a good bit of furniture for 120 pounds. Everyone loves a cuckoo clock. Bit of taxidermy. It's all fashionable at the moment, though. Massively. His years around the family antiques business clearly aren't wasted. Broke. Lawrence discovers a shocking truth. He's become a museum piece. It's amazing, the things from my youth that are now worth money. I mean, look at these little Thomas the Tank engine things. There's, there's loads of... Uh, it's all very interesting, all these little bits and pieces. Lawrence and Kev's Antiques Roadshow is brought to a halt by the arrival of the business owner, who asks our camera to leave. He says he doesn't know anything about this debt and doesn't want to pay. But Lawrence's writ says he owes the money and must pay today. Finally, after racking his memory, the man realises what the debt's for and which company it's owed to. He's also left in no uncertain terms that if he doesn't pay, his antiques are in jeopardy. He goes online and makes the payment by bank transfer. It's a good result for the company that supplied the timber, who will now be getting the money the court agreed is theirs. And once they'd convinced the antiques dealer he really did owe the money, a straightforward assignment for the sheriffs. The debtor wasn't, got, wasn't there when we got there, but the people in the shop called him and he was there within 20 minutes. The fellow was a nice enough guy in there. Held his hands up too once we established what it was. All in all, a nice, easy, successful job. The antiques dealer told us he deeply regretted the situation that arose, which was in connection with a personal matter and was not related to his business at the antique shop. He said he was a self-employed man trying to maintain a business during times of financial difficulty and had not deliberately attempted to avoid payment. <laughs> 